me at Jello, Jello. You had me at Jello. You had me at Jello. Oh, you had me at Jello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's five o'clock on a Friday. Time for Cello Chat. And with me this week is Beth Kaiser. Beth, how are you doing? I'm great, Benjamin. Thank you for asking me on. Great. Always great to visit with you. I'm very much looking forward to this as well. So for the sake of the audience, how about would you tell your musical background uh, and what even drew you to cello in the first place? Oh, geez. You know, that's something like that's something I kind of struggle with because it um, it's it's a long, you know, it's kind of a long story. But um, I came from a musical family like so many of us. Right. My grandmother was a pianist. Um, and every Wednesday of my life, she would go to the nursing home. And when I was a little girl, I'd have to push the wheelchairs in and she'd play piano. And then as um, I got older, um, it was her page turner and then she'd feature me on a song and then we'd do duets and um about the time I got to high school um she started traveling and suddenly the Wednesday nursing home gig was my job <laughs> and so my string quartet would go or I'd go by myself um you know and I just grew up um in a family where music was considered an opportunity to serve and so we served our community whether it was in the church or in the at the university in choral groups, my mother was a choir conductor, um, or whether it was nursing homes, we were, we had the opportunity to, to share our music. And so that's, that's, um, I think, what's sort of the way I was raised, right? Always in the choir, always um, there to perform. But then um, my grandmother gave me a book about music therapy by Helen Bonney called Music in Your Mind in like 1974. And I became fascinated with the field of music therapy. And finally, a cello teacher came to our town and I was able to switch from piano to cello. And I, I really wanted to um, be in the orchestra. So I practiced super hard. Um, and I started playing cello in middle school. And um, I had a wonderful teacher, Kathleen Franceschi, who was new to Stevens Point. And I grew up in northern Wisconsin. And she was like, oh, Lord, how did I end up in this godforsaken wilderness? She didn't know how to drive a car in the snow. And I did. So suddenly I was Miss Franceschi's Kathy's chauffeur. And we went to every little Fox Valley Symphony, you know, Platteville Symphony, Tomahawk, you know, um, Chamber Festival. And everywhere she went, I drove her. She took me and I sat beside her. And so she was really, um, became my dear friend and, and eventually colleague. And so I was able to study with her and she was preparing for her performance at um, Carnegie Hall and she was doing the Rococo Variations. And suddenly she had to teach this brand new Suzuki program. And she's like, Beth, will you teach them? I don't want to teach those little kids. And I was like, me? Sure, I like little kids. So I had my very first students um, when I was in high school. And I was a part of the, uh, the fledgling Suzuki program there. I had a little, a chubby little four-year-old girl named Chelsea who was as round as her cello and a cute little boy, um, two little four-year-olds. And, you know, my sister had grown up in Suzuki, so I had watched her lessons my whole life. And so I just sort of brought that in and, yeah, ended up down in Milwaukee because I had a scholarship there, studied with Wolfgang Laffer, um, Really got involved with Yehudia Yunai and the Center for 20th Century Studies and loved doing contemporary music and chamber music and played in a bunch of rock and roll bands. I had the first Marcus Berry cello pickup that I was working with Brian Ritchie and he was in the band at Thames and he got me that pickup. So I started playing a lot of rock and roll, became a music therapist, um, got my license to teach so I could do music therapy in the schools, played all over the place, then had children and it's too hard to gig and wear black while you're nursing babies. It just, it's not didn't work for me back in the um, 80s. And so I um, started doing more music therapy and teaching and I've been doing music therapy and teaching really all my life. I mean, <laughs> when I think about it, I never really decided to be a musician. It's just how my life evolved very naturally. Very nice, very nice. And I, and I feel blessed, you know, I feel so blessed. I. I um, I think it wasn't really ever a decision, but I never regret that I did this. 
just that I don't have more time to do more now that the science is evolving, you know, and, and um, the idea of finishing a PhD in the neuroscience of how music impacts human behavior and health and wellness, that to me is fascinating. And so, you know, here I am like 60 plus and I just, I just want to keep doing it and learning more. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Continuing education. It's a thing. A lot of musicians get that, you know? Yeah. Now, so one of the one of the themes with this series is motivating students to practice. And I, I suppose I, I want to know in whatever order you want to answer these, I want to know kind of what your general go to things are for helping students to put in the, the time with the cello in order to advance as much as they could. I mean, because it's fun to be good at something, but then also what it is that you do with your particular studio that makes them so inspired across the board to be to play so musically. You're sweet to say that. And I'm, I'm really honored that you say that, Benjamin, because you work with so many kids. Well, I know when you come to work with us, my kids are all so excited that they do their very best. So you can see them on their great days, you know. Um, and when I think about it, there, there are a, a, a couple of things. I think the philosophy that I really work with is to whom much is given, much is expected. And we're so blessed to be together in this beautiful space, right? And how can we use our music really to make the world a better place and to make ourselves feel better? And I truly believe that all children are altruistic and good, you know, they're good and they want to do good and they see their cello, we create opportunities for kids to play like I did in nursing homes and in community service projects. Every year, my seniors pick a project, whether it's the Malala Fund, you know, for reading or um, the Humane Society or a music scholarship. We've done um, the Red Crisis Center. We've done literacy programs, food banks. Every year, the kids pick a cause to raise money. And we play in different community set settings to support this cause. So I think that the kids really want to do a good, do good. They want to do good in their communities. And especially in the past few you know, years when life has been hard, um, kids need an opportunity to feel good about themselves and who they are and what they do. So one is they can use their instrument to serve. But then the other thing is, how does my instrument make me feel inside? And I say there's three rules in my, well, four rules in my studio, but one, respectful, responsible, and fun to be around. If you can't be fun to be around, you call darn it going to be useful, right? So most of them choose fun. And then we say, how can we really have fun with our cellos? And what does it feel like? What do the vibrations feel like? And we really learn to listen with our whole body. And we learn to listen with our breath. And we learn to play with other people from the very get-go. We have overlap lessons from the time they're four years old where they're meeting with one another and they're listening to each other and they're playing back and forth and they're immersing themselves, their whole body in a sensory experience um, and then sharing it with the other people in the room and then taking that into the community so that it becomes relevant. And, and the kids want to be relevant. And so I, I, I think those are probably the factors. And then also just really, I guess the third thing is that we really, you know, oftentimes kids, especially when they start older and come from the public schools are bohan. Well, every teacher fixes your bohan, no matter who you go to, right? But their oh. bohan will be backwards in their posture. And you, and you have to like say, okay, they're discouraged or they need a teacher because they're their postural um, situation is inhibiting their progress. Mm -hmm. And so from the very get-go, just using an, a really strong foundation and building excellent technique and capacity to play because they know how to manipulate and use their inherent motor skills um, and develop those sequentially so that each lesson is a lesson in success. You know, nice. yeah. So I would say... Um, that when a kid comes to a lesson, the kid needs to walk away feeling like not only did they have fun, nurture their hearts, but they succeeded at something. And maybe they made another friend and their relationships got stronger. And um, so that, that it was worth it, 
to walk in the door. Like, why are you walking in my door? It felt I better be worth it. Nice. So well, that, is that an answer for you, Benjamin? Yeah, that's great. Well, I mean, I really find when when students are just, that's the way to go. When students are just playing their heart out. And of course, there's always technical stuff to work on. But that is, to me, so much easier to work on technical things, but they already have the passion there in the performance than to take somebody who's always been very, very analytical and very uh, accurate and to try to make it sound like that is a meaningful performance. You know what I mean? To try and add musicality after they've kind of, in some cases, sterilized it. Well, and, you know, one of, my, one of my most advanced students this week, we just did a performance. Um, we, we merged with Suzuki Strings of Madison, and I, I love the Suzuki pedagogical approach. You know, I was raised in it. Um, I'm not strict Suzuki, but I really, really appreciate it. And we did a play down in the traditional class, you know, um, format, and we ended with a chorale of French folk song. And we did this, we did Hoi Mandango, you know, with, with um, 16 cellists for our opening number. That was so fun and exciting. And then we did Kurs Feldbaum for the Promised Land, really tried to pick local composers and pieces that really bring out the cello repertoire. And at the end, on French folk song, I had like 35 cellists on the stage, and my little twinklers, pre twinks, were. A, 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 you know, just doing their beautiful long bow A's. And one of my most advanced students said, when I said, what did you like about the concert? She said, Beth, you know, it's just so great to play French folk song with everybody. And that chorale is just such a beautiful, just like it's uplifting to all be together and to play something that simple with artistry. And, and, and there's nothing... There's no shame in playing the most, you know, beautiful melody, a simple, beautiful melody, just well. Yeah. Absolutely. And and the, um, I think it was just probably silent in the room afterwards because watching all of those kids just play from their hearts and without music and together, you know, um, I as hard as we worked on some of the other songs. I, I think maybe Calypso by Joanne Martin, when one of them was shaking maracas and another one was playing thumb drum and French folk song were, I hate to say it, but they might've been the highlights. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with that. Now, don't let me put words in your mouth, but in terms of what you're saying about the, uh, the technique, the technical end of things, you know, so for some students, maybe the, they know why they're playing cello when they're finding uh, a way to really express in a particular piece of music. But when it comes time to fix those technical things, to do what it takes to learn to execute a shift better or do a string crossing better or whatever the situation is, that sometimes maybe they're not as motivated unless, I mean, what it sounds like you're saying in some cases, like in the case of the posture, when you can point out to them, this is what's blocking you from expressing fully. You know what I mean? That that it's not do these technical things because I say so. It's, all right, you want to get from here to there. And here's something that's a technical thing that's that's in your way let's talk about what you'd have to do to get it out of your way. Something like that? Um, so when I approach technique, you know, the kids have practice sequences, like they have practice routines that I really try to adhere to. And it often has, you know, scales, um, simple etudes, music games, um, you know, just just games all the time games, especially with the younger ones, but even with the older ones, like when I teach shifting, there's four playground games. You know, there's the slide, there's hopscotch where you find the, the you throw the stone, you land on the stone and you place. There's the underdock, which, you know, boy, that one's fun, right? And a little bit thrilling. How do you do an underdock? And then there's, you know, there's the um, butterfly stroke. Um, and, um, so I think often when I approach technique, without, I do it without music. Like I don't teach Cosman looking at the music. If I pulled out a Cosman book, I have this whole stack of books. And I say, do you really want me to send this whole list of books home for you to buy? 
or do you want me to copy some and will you practice them? And, and then when they're really like, you might not like this, but when they're really motivated, I let them borrow my Benjamin books. <laughs> I have a stack of Benjamin and they love those. And I know that if you, you know, the kids will buy those too, but it's like a really big honor to get to borrow my popper etudes or to borrow um, a book by, by Dr. Whitcomb or, you know, so I have my, my, my stacks of books and I'll show, and we'll pick out things, but oftentimes we teach those things without looking at the music because the music initially can, you know, can be um, very overwhelming or I'll pick like a phrase out of a certain etude that will really help a technique that they're working on. Um, and we'll, we'll approach it really organically from separating the left hand, the right hand, and, and really looking at what is the one specific goal that we're working on and then why, again, why is it relevant? If it's not relevant, then they're not going to be motivated. If they want to master something for a competition or for a solo and ensemble or for an audition or a solo, then what can we do? What strategies can we use to help the sound as beautiful and as comfortable as possible? Because I want you to feel like you're owning it. So what do you do to own this? And what are the techniques? And after, you know, after a few years, they know the books and they start to order them, but really kind of trick kids mm -hmm. into, into doing, I mean, they start their cosmony too. It's like when they're like little beaners with, you know, do, 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 do. I mean, the shark song is a cosmic exercise, right? Yeah. And so, you know, a bowl placement is where does the shark screech? You know, mm -hmm. is he up above the fingerboard or does he go down below? Um, so how many different ways can we make stories out of technique building? Can we create images around it? And what is the goal? And then also the discipline, you know, just doing it with them and saying, we're going to do this is going to be hard, but I want you to pinky, I pinky square with kids all the time that you'll do this for the first five minutes before you play your favorite thing, please. You know, and, and I've been known to text kids. Did you, did you your fingers? <laughs> Power, your teacher's watching you. Did, right, right. did you practice your agents? So, um, yeah, I, th I think definitely doing it without music, developing the habitual patterns of doing it, making it fun, doing it with them. Mm -hmm. And then showing them all the different ways that you can approach it. Um, and chords, you know, I think the chords that you teach are... Your chord book is great. And I think doing things with double stops and chords and in harmony and then playing things backwards and then improvising on themes. And, okay, so you don't like this fingering. Um, so you don't like this. I have one kid right now who's doing proper mazurka. And she's like, what if I did this? And I'm like, yeah, I added double stop there for sure. Oh, you don't like that? Well, you know, I don't think Popper will mind that much. If you if you change it around, you want to play it up the octave. You think that you heard it up the octave in recordings? Okay. What about down the octave? What about in a different key? You know, yeah. what do you want to do? Do you want to write your own cadenza here? Or do you just want to do the first page and then make up your own ending? So things like that, where, yes. where we're not, um, I'm not necessarily married when it's not a public performance. You know, I'm not married to, um, always married exactly to the music if a kid wants to modify it to make it their own. Absolutely. And they grow more through that. They grow more. And every good musician borrows their ideas from other, other great musicians. So, yeah, that's a part of the learning process, too. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, can you talk also about? I, I really enjoy the uh, number of, of people that I've had on this series have not just had a uh, high degree of creativity, but of initiative as well. So when you have an idea, you act on it. So can you talk a bit about some of the, the things along those lines, the Madison Cello Ensemble, uh, summer camps, things that you've just thought, well, that would be a good idea. And you just haven't said, well, I'll wait until somebody knocks on my door and has taken the reins. But you take the initiative yourself. Oh, wow. Well, a big, a big motivator is having a, a musical family, right? A child that plays cello. Yeah. 
So when she was a little girl getting over to Michigan or up to Stevens Point or down to Dubuque, some of the music camps were super expensive. And there was no, there was no cello camp um, focused on cello playing, not orchestra in Wisconsin. So my students really needed to play solo repertoire, needed coaching in, in um, their technique related to cello playing. They didn't need to go to another orchestra camp per se. And um, it was, there was, there wasn't one, right? There was, there wasn't one uh, that was affordable. And we had this great collective of string teachers, Flora Von Warmer and Eric Miller and um, Andy Johnson and Peter Anderson. And you know, we have all these wonderful teachers who have students and we were looking for ways to collaborate, to bring summer opportunities to them that were affordable. And my daughter was playing in a little, a little ensemble that at the time they were like seven and eight years old and they called themselves the Cool Cats Cello Club. And they played for youth festivals. And that type of thing. Um, so we started our first cello camp, I think, in 2004 in my, or three in my backyard and then moved into a church. And it just sort of grew. And every year we get between 20 and 35, 40 kids. Um, I think once we maxed out at about close right before the pandemic, close to close to 60. Um, and and then um, the cello retreats we do at our cabin up north. I would take kids up to Suzuki camp and we, the moms would stay out at the cabin. And pretty soon the kids were like, we want to stay at the cabin. It's cooler. It's not, you know, the dorms were air conditioned and that evolved into a really special thing for high school kids to go on a three-day retreat at our cabin. Um, you know, I had lots of parents, lots of moms who were super motivated and would drive with me and help me coordinate when we played the Bach to Rock stage and, um, at Summerfest, um, again, the Violent Femmes were closing and Jane Hollander was opening and all these parents were all about going to take our kids to do it. So a big part of it is the relationships that the moms develop and the parents develop with one another. I shouldn't say moms, that sounds a little sexist um, because there's some great cello dads too, tons of great cello dads, but the relationships they develop and then how can we create opportunities for our kids, you know, they, that are affordable and then that oftentimes like the Make Music Madison Festival that we've been doing, Sisters Inception, is a fundraiser. So it's a chance for their kids to give back. Um, so a collaboration with great, great friends and colleagues. Um, we're doing the, the triple folk fiddle and um, festival with Music Cumbria and Wysel Music Makers, Suzuki Strings in Madison. And that came out of a meeting at the brand new My Art Center that we're lucky to be housed in now. And um, folks from the Sugar Maple Festival came and said, hey, we're bringing these bands um, to work with kids. And it was like, yeah, you you offered something? You betcha. <laughs> let's, let's see what we can do. Um, coming out of the pandemic, I thought that would be a great way to collaborate with others and bounce back in and develop relationships and build our community because you know, there's so many kids um, with interest and need, and there's not enough teachers to go around. And I think maybe one of the biggest strengths of our studio is that it's so non-competitive. You know, it's it's a place where everyone brings their gifts and talents and everyone has a place, um, whether it's a brand new teacher, you know, like Sydney Stankowski is going to be joining us. Just a wonderful player, right? Just finished, just graduated. Or you, I mean, both of you, at opposite ends of the experience spectrum, but what you both bring together and that energy and the love of cello that you bring together grows, you know, it grows. And there's, we're, we're not, we're non-competitive and really about, about feeling, having fun and blessing each other with, with our music and being together. Yeah, in that it's so wonderful to have a environment in the studio that is supportive first. You know, I I totally agree. That's, my that's my kids are my cool. kids are being peer mentors. Um, my older ones at this music experience we're doing this summer. My high school kids signed up as peer mentors, and they're so excited. So they're going to be doing two days of workshops prior to this to prepare to be peer mentors and to learn repertoire to perform for the kids. So they're all excited because they you know they're my 15, 16 year olds who are all out of the Suzuki books, and they're going to be um learning the fiddle tunes, but learning advanced variations and then putting fiddle tunes together in um, quartets. And they're very excited because they get to work at their level 
and be and be role models. Um, and that was again, that was my way of tricking them into coming to, to this experience. <laughs> and they plus they're all, they all like each other. At this point, they've played together for so long, they're all buddies, and it's like, yeah, we get to be together. Yeah, yeah. So does that sound really evil when I say tricking them? No, because they end up thanking you for it. They end up having fun, yeah, and they don't realize that um it's good for them. They think they're they think they're helping and they are, but they're also getting a lot out of it. Right. Well, in a way, like the your I mean philosophy of turning a lot of technique into games is a way that I mean you don't have to say to the student, okay, well, this is going to be very difficult and we have to do this number of repetitions of this and we have to do it very precisely like this. If you make a game in it, in I mean, from from your perspective, for example, it might seem like tricking them into doing technique, but it's just a way to make it really accessible activity that is that is as engaging as possible. And, and I will do it. I will go through like 10 different methods of learning a fast passage with kids in the lesson. You know, it might take half of the lesson, but I was like, we're going to do this together. And it does require discipline. And good on you, Matt. Look at how determined you are. Look at that self-discipline and rigor that you're demonstrating. These are the things that are going to take you far. Like, oh, God forbid you become a professional musician and end up, you know, <laughs> a poor broke teacher, be an engineer or something, you know. But this discipline, this rigor, this this um, focus that you're showing me right now. Well, I'm so proud of that, you know, because that's what it takes to succeed in anything. And if it's easy, man, if it's easy, then maybe it's really not that worth it. You know, so I, I certainly expect rigor and 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 admire and and, and commend it in my students um, and help them develop it. But but it doesn't have to be painful. Yeah. All right. Well, what about um, summer projects? Fall? What else do you have going on in twenty twenty two? Oh, gee. Well, we're doing the Triple Forte Festival that I alluded to with Sugar Maple at the end of July, the first week of August. And that's one of our main projects we're getting um, geared up for. We're doing um, Make Music Madison as a fundraiser for our scholarship program at, outside the My Arts building and have invited other groups to perform with us. So that's on Mifflin Street in Madison. I think it's 1055 Mifflin Street, right in the Lapham School parking lot. So rather than being inside, we're going to be outside under a big tent just to make it more fun and to encourage people. I think the light is getting really bad here. I'm sorry. The sun is coming up. Um, so, and then we're doing a cello retreat. Then in the fall, we'll be back at My Arts with um, Suzuki Strings of Madison having our Tuesday night workshops, which we hope you'll be a good guest at now that the pandemic is, is easing off, um, hopefully easing off. So we'll be doing that. Um, and then just more collaboration with, with, um, with other teachers. Um, Tina, um, who's Thompson and runs a studio and she's a great fiddle player, is hosting some workshops and asks for cellists to be involved with that. So looking for ways to create different genres and styles and opportunities, um, but but really focus right now on building the not-for-profit and creating accessible um, cello experiences for kids, regardless of, of their ability to pay or really their experience level. It's okay to come into our cello program. I have five adult students right now, all over 60, and they have a little band called Tom and the Razanets. <laughs> That's sweet. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're having a blast. So um, that's important. You know, trying to make sure that we're playing, we're playing the Great Taste of Madison. That's always a great fundraiser. The adults, not the kids, <laughs> play the beer fest. Yeah. Um, but that brings the kids back. That you know, my college kids come back to play together for the beer festival, and then they partner one on one with with my high school kids outside of that, and and we'll have like a gathering so they get to see one another again, and we just play chamber music in the backyard. That's great. That's a great way to spend time, isn't it? I love it. I love it that they come home at Christmas and they come home. Um, yeah, I love that they come home to play together. I'm sure a tradition like that, they love it too. Yeah, I had just had one of my seniors who's graduating say, Beth, you're going to keep me on the list, right? I get to come home for solstice. So every solstice since um, 
probably 1998, we've had a solstice celebration with cellos and we do songs of peace and we do songs from a variety of different um, holidays of light. And that most of them end up being traditional Christmas carols because that's the best way I know of to develop a perfect fourth finger. And in, in you know, how many Christmas carols start with those, you know, don't fa fa fa. <laughs> so I'll never, I'm never going to drop the, the holiday um, music because it, it just really reinforces musicianship, but the kids come back to do it year. I had kids fly in last year from Colorado or the year before the pandemic from Colorado and New Mexico, just to be home for the holiday, even though their parents don't live here anymore. So that, that's really, that feels good. And yeah, that feels really good that they come home to play cello. I'm their cello mama. That's awesome. <laughs> well, excellent. Very inspiring. It's easy to see why so many of your students do uh, just really play their hearts out when they have the cello in their hand. You have baked a lot of this uh, philosophy into, you know, the very every aspect of the way that you teach them, which is fabulous. Thank you so much, Benjamin. I feel so blessed, you know, and honestly, I learned so much. I said to the kids, now what, I often say, what am I going to learn from you today, you know? Um, and that's what's so exciting. The repertoire may be similar um, for years, a lot of the standards, but each kid who approaches it is different. And now my young, my young ones who are teachers and professionals, you know, Catherine Cannon playing in, in Minnesota, Zuzu in Canada, my daughter, Margaret, Sydney, Rose, they come back and, you know, my joy is how, how they've evolved as musicians. And frankly, they're better players than me at this point, right? And it's like, you, you kids rock it. Yeah. And they're grown up, so I probably shouldn't call them kids anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> rewarding to help them get so there. So exciting to see them loving it and making it, making it, doing it. And I, and I think that's part of what motivates our kids, too, is they see the older ones. They People don't leave the studio forever. They come back and we make a big deal about them coming home. Mm-hmm. And then we see what, what kids who were in their place, you know, 15 years ago have done. Uh-huh. And those kids still feel like, even though they're in their thirties or they're adults now, even though they're you know, some of them pushing forty, or my oldest student is fifty-two. <laughs> <laughs> but the young ones see these 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 other students who've grown up and continue to love it and made it a part of their life, whether it's as a professional musician or uh, a mom bringing their child to lessons now. And they see how am I going to make shallow a part of my life you know how will it how will it stay in my life and they see that they can do that perfect i think it's just a silhouette now i'm so sorry my light changed during this meeting that's the sun for you yeah (laughs) all right no problem uh thanks so much beth it's been a real treat visiting with you and I'm sure very inspiring for the viewers as well and they're all I'm sure going to get their cellos out now and practice like crazy all weekend <laughs> we're getting ready for this fiddle fest so I hope we do too and I have to end by saying that my friend Dale Kaminsky is here he, I played with him in liquid pink in college and he worked with you at Whitewater so he wanted me to make sure to give you his regards and say hello he's Get crashing, and we're right now. We've been staying up late and playing old band tunes. <laughs> what fun! What fun! Well, yeah, thank you guys a lot. All right, well, right. so so everybody, for inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely. But pleasure is mine, and everybody will see you this time next Friday. Happy Take practicing. Care. Take care, everyone.